if you are someone who has been engaged in some kind of a spiritual quest for a long time, you have been officially or unofficially on a spiritual journey, but you still feel tremendous suffering or angst. And really, your wardrobe may have changed, your lingo may have changed, what you do on your weekends may have changed. But what hasn't changed is your own relationship with your own truth. Then you might be caught up in a web of spiritual hacking. You might be a victim of some misnomers that have become the truth in our era. These, I have been told by some of my students, are known under the umbrella term of spiritual hacking. And I was requested to shed some light on um, how we can unhack what we have bought into from our gullibility, from our innocence, and how can we actually move forward in our spiritual quest because each one of us is a spirit in an embodied form and we deserve to know our truth we deserve to have a deeper intimate relationship with a higher power and we deserve to find some deeper meaning purpose and tools to deal with the ups and downs of life isn't that the the whole promise of spirituality and so what happened in between and how did we get caught up in chasing a shadow of spirituality rather than spirituality itself? So I would like to take you along in the first hour of this Global Satsang Classroom on a journey of understanding some most common uh, spiritual hacks that you want to be aware of. And we will do a 15 minute Q&A right after, so 45 minutes of me sharing what I know about this and 15 minutes of Q&A. And then in the next hour, I would like to show you step-by-step step, systematically a process which the Vedic ancient seers, the men and women known as Rishis and Rishikas had already established in place so that we're not gullible, we're not uh, confused, we don't, um, you know, step in the wrong alley and route to our greatest potential and stay lost and trapped forever. So let's do that, shall we? So I can say this, that right now I'm talking to you. I, am, I welcome you from whichever part of the world you are joining me. I welcome the students around me. For many years I have been teaching these students and some of them come and sit with me in person. And I will also be referring from time to time to my laptop, not because I'm reading my teaching, because um, I always teach in the now from my soul, but I have put some points there just so that I can stay concise um, in this 45 minute journey. So all of us put together are going to create a transformative experience. I believe that knowledge is enough. Once we are informed, we can step out of any darkness and move with greater confidence towards light. This is not to feel ashamed, not to feel uh, stupid, not to feel, oh no, frustrated with yourself. This is to say, wow, hmm, interesting. So that's what I was caught up with. Let me now move forward with greater clarity. So you will agree that organized religion over these last several decades has um, worldwide taken a back seed and uh, pretty much the most people at least in America uh, are identifying themselves as atheists or agnostics or maybe even spiritually unaffiliated but that still doesn't take away the human quest for greater meaning greater connection potentially a greater joy or a more a positive overall beneficial life to ourselves, our family, our kith and kin, our community, and our planet? Isn't this the basic premise on which we wake up every day? Today will be a better day. 
So because religion took a backseat, spirituality has come up in the forefront. However, we are at a stage of human evolution and spirituality where there is a lot of confusion. And this is therefore very ripe as an environment for spiritual hacks to even exist. So let's just look at our times right now in Sanskrit, the period that we humans are dwelling in from a consciousness perspective is a dark period. It is known as the period of Kali Yuga. And in Kali Yuga, it is said that the blind will lead the blind <laughs> and the blind will happily follow the blind. So teachers and followers are equally not enlightened with light. So this is very exceptional time. There is a bounty of spiritual teachings, method, techniques, teachers, and you can literally take your pick. I don't know about you, but my partner Sanjay has taken me to some amazing places where you can put together your own pizza, albeit with organic ingredients. Have you done that? You can put together your own pizza. It's in the same way you can put together your own spiritual journey. A little bit of traditional Advaita Vedanta from India by teachers like myself, maybe. A little bit of Neo Vedanta by American teachers who sneer at the teachings from India. A little bit of shamanism, a little bit of Buddhism. How about a tiny drop of Zen? Mm, I love crystal therapy. How about polarity, prana and yoga? Hmm, Hindu gods and goddesses, nah, they're not enough. How about Greek and Egyptian gods and goddesses to go with it? Not to forget the new age salad of divine love, oneness, wellness, and the hidden power of the brain to manifest and attract what you want and to disappear from your life what you don't want. I got my plate ready. Unfortunately, these remain shallow ventures shallow promises, shallow fulfillment, a kind of a very hedonistic, ego-driven, um, spiritual consumerism, which drives spiritual sales. So we have in this world today a multi-billion industry of the spiritual awakening. But alas, the human lot hasn't changed much, has it? Because it remains an industry of quick gains, quick losses, and ultimately quick fixes. Is somebody doing this to us? No. There are no bad guys. We're not the victim here. We humans have a tendency to get a little lost in our trips. History will show it to you. And right now we are on a spiritual trip because we all want to know the secret. We want that one key that's going to unlock all the happiness and abundance in the world and make disappear all the sorrow. It's almost like we want to create an artificial El Dorado. And that is why probably some of my students requested me to shed light on that because they themselves have been um, sincere but not making progress. We're talking about how to avoid spiritual bypassing and really further our quest in a genuine way. It does not mean necessarily that you have to be my student or prescribe only to the Vedic path. What I am about to teach you is universal. And no matter what you are currently um, fascinated by, that could be the door. And I would invite you to go deeper rather than remaining superficially consuming bits and bytes of spiritual teachings. In a way, when we have too much going on, uh, too many offerings, too many options. That's quite the opposite of what you should be 
really doing. Your mind should be less full of ideas and concepts and very clear as to where it is proceeding. So let us move forward and understand that we don't want to follow a, spirit, a spiritual trend of making spirituality a hobby or gaining a new personality like bypassing and creating something wondrous but inside you remain suffering, torn and broken. You don't necessarily want to have a spirituality that is adorned with a vocabulary and a wardrobe. You really want to connect with the truth of your spiritual being with God with the truth behind this universe. So it is about returning to your natural state. And there are many beautiful spiritual traditions that can do that, they can help us. Let us learn to help ourselves and let us not get caught up, caught up in this Kali Yuga time of darkness with spiritual hacks. Now, have you heard of this beautiful statement called follow your bliss isn't that beautiful has it helped you at different times yes i see some yeses has it hurt you at any time follow your bliss or confused you anyone now follow your bliss the doors will open where there were only walls how magical like you can literally you open your doors by following your bliss this was a statement made by Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, born on March 26, 1904, who transitioned in 1987, is a very well-known American professor of literature at the Sarah Lawrence College. And he worked with comparative mythology and comparative religion. And let me just tell you straight out, that he was very influenced by the Vedas and the Upanishads, and in fact inspired by the Vedic hymn Purusha Sukta, which talks about the spiritual being having a thousand heads. He wrote the most famous book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Now, he gave this teaching out, Follow Your Bliss. And he gave it again, influenced by the Vedic Upanishads. And I'm quoting him. He wrote, now, I came to this idea of bliss because in Sanskrit, which is the great spiritual language of the world, there are three terms that represent the brink, the jumping off place to the ocean of transcendence, Sat, Chit, Ananda. My students are smiling. They know these words. The word Sat, means being, original being. Chit means consciousness. Ananda means bliss or rapture. And I'm still quoting him. He continued, I thought to myself, I don't know whether my consciousness is proper consciousness not or not. I don't know whether what I know of my being is my proper being or not. But I do know that my rapture is proper. So, let me hang on to rapture, and that will bring me both my consciousness and my being. I think it worked. He saw this, follow your bliss, not only as a mantra for himself, but as a helpful guide to every average American who was having a renaissance uh, to help them along their hero's journey, okay? So then he said, if you follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while waiting for you. And the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living. That's what you will find. Wherever you are, if you're following your bliss, you're enjoying that refreshment, that life within you all the time. Now, very beautiful you know, writing and it, it created a revolution of, you know, sorts because Campbell began sharing this idea during his college and public lectures, especially after his book when he became famous uh, from the 1970s onwards. And um, pretty much Follow Your Bliss became a philosophy that resonated deeply with the American public, by the way both religious and secular. And it you know, has 
we, it has started a whole trend of follow your bliss, you know, smoothies, follow your bliss retreats, follow your bliss yoga practices, follow your bliss in every which way, right down to I'm filing for a divorce because I'm following my bliss. I'm getting married to this person who gives everybody else a red flag in their mind because I'm following my bliss. So it really became in positive and not so positive ways, a mantra that drove the Western Renaissance spirituality. But it also gave birth to a lot of hedonism. Is that how you pronounce that word, hedonism? Uh, because in India, I would say hedonism, but it's hedonism. The reason I want to speak like you is because I'm talking to you. So I want my language to come across. So when his students and many people pointed out to him that this is giving birth to hedonism, he grumbled and said, I should have said, follow your blisters. <laughs> <laughs> Which means he didn't really want to encourage hedonism. He didn't want to do that. But it happened because there is no context to following your, your bliss. So people started literally following their bliss outside. Now, Sat Chit or Ananda, I'll talk about it, is such a vast concept. It takes the whole Vedic teaching is about discovering Sat Chit and Ananda, and you can't really take apart Ananda from discovery of the inner being, Sat, or that consciousness which is Chit. You can't really follow it, you know, in your outer life. But he, but the way he put it, it really became about following the bliss. What makes you happy? Following the pleasures. If this person and this teacher staying with them gives me pleasure, I stay with them. Otherwise, I move on. I'm a happy camper. I'm going to change my contracts because I'm going to follow my bliss. So I'm not the only one criticizing it long, long ago, even when he was alive. We have a written many written criticisms of these teachings including from a gentleman called Jeffrey Mason, who was actually a professor of Sanskrit in the University of Toronto. And he writes, when I met Campbell at a public gathering, he was quoting Sanskrit verses. He had no clue as to what he was talking about. He had the most superficial knowledge of India, but he could use it for his own aggrandizement. Now, this is not to say that Westerners cannot teach Sanskrit. From all the Vedic astrologers I know, my, my, my respect goes to an American Vedic astrologer. The foreword of my best-selling former book, Ayurveda Lifestyle Wisdom, was written by an American Vedic teacher. The point is not American and Indian. The point is the people who we are worshipping or giving or thinking they are sources of knowledge because they are quoting some fascinating bits and bites from ancient traditions. The people who have agreed to look up to, to guide us, guide our culture, guide our search, guide our quest, have they done their homework or not? The astrologer and the person who wrote my foreword and countless Western and European colleagues of mine they have, who have done their work, I myself look up to them. But because we are exploring this, I just, I've just given you one incident of how following your bliss became the Western search for spirituality in the gross world of our senses and connected it to our pleasure. What is bliss then really? What is ananda? Bliss, ananda is that which is not related to our search outside because if my ananda was in my partner, in my pet, in my cup of coffee, in my boat, in my house, at some time or the other when death, distance, destruction, diminution, takes that away from me, then my bliss is up to them. Then I am nothing but a cosmic victim, the most vulnerable, frail <laughs> thing alive. The whole purpose of the Upanishads when they were saying, Sat, bliss is connected to your inner being, Sat, 
to your inner consciousness was that it has nothing to do with people and possessions outside you. This was a basic premise that Mr. Campbell, though he came from a good place and was clearly very joyous of his particular discovery, was in no way ready to make this a proclamation. And then countless gullible generations have converted this outer feel-good, pleasure-based, abundance-based, things-based spirituality into a new religion. Because then you're simply giving your ego more toys and more toys. And the journey to discovering your bliss within never began. Now, in my own life, I have had things come to me and taken away from me. When I was younger, as in emotionally younger, not necessarily physically younger, when I was spiritually younger, we all have spiritual childhood, adolescence, you know, youth, adulthood, and sage-like experience. When I was younger, when things and people or relationships didn't work out, you know, they would not only be a nuisance at that time, a problem, but it would be a hit upon me forever. Some part of me, M-E, got diminished. But now, when things come to me, I don't get overexcited because my bliss is up to me. And when things get taken away, I'm human. It's still, you pinch me, it's going to hurt. It's still a little bit of a problem or a nuisance, but it doesn't take away my joy. Do you see that? There is a greater, we call it pinder. There is a greater deposit of bliss that I can bliss, joy, okayness, calmness, positivity that comes from within me. Okay. So there was not at all a desire for things to go away because we were told that we are human beings and we have come here to enjoy the world the sunshine, the river, but we are not here to be dependent on them. This is so revelatory, don't you think so? If you had been told this, that your bliss is up to you, turned within, this would have led to a whole different movement versus follow your bliss because it almost leads to an outward movement of tracking, following, questing your bliss. So it didn't do much. Because anyway, in our ordinary human consciousness, though we have such it ananda within us, we are incapable of experiencing pure ananda. We drink a cup of coffee, we love it, and we say, oh, it just gave me so much bliss. Because that cup of coffee, for a minute, calm down our mind from searching anything else, and then you experience inner ananda. So we experience inner ananda via the cup of coffee, via the orgasm, via the cute puppy, via the beautiful sunrise. Why? Because at that moment, the mind and the senses, they just go like this. And the moment they stop questing, following anything else, in that moment, the inner ananda shows up. But until we keep searching, we're not there yet. So therefore, but in our everyday sense, our senses, our mind, our ego that is attached to the last thing that connected us to our bliss, we are unable, unable to go within. And the whole spiritual journey is about not letting your senses roam wildly in the world, looking for the next high looking for the next thing that will give you your dose of bliss. You can, you can say, I love my Starbucks coffee because it gives me pleasure of exactly four minutes. That's real. That's, oh, and then afterwards it gives me heartburn and then I think, should I be drinking Starbucks or not? And then, you know, and then it gives me emotional, mental, physical turmoil is another thing. That's how things happen in the world. So it, 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 this was de-hacked. If, if, if our teachers knew the deeper truth, if they had done the work, they would know that 
this was de-hacked by the Upanishads. Bhagavad Gita is an Upanishad. Thousands of years ago, and Lord Krishna says the exact opposite of this teaching. He doesn't say, follow your bliss. He says, Dhyayato vishyan pumsaha Sangas te shupajayate Sangat sanjayate kamaha Kamat krodo bhijayate Krodat bhavati sammohaha Sammoha smriti vibhramaha Smriti bhamshad buddhi nashaha Buddhi nashad pranashyate What was Lord Krishna saying? The very opposite teaching. And this is the teaching, it is the essence um, of spiritual life that I have been giving to some of the students who, who, who have gone inwards in the, in the search for bliss. They are still in the world. They still enjoy the world, but they are not dependent upon it. And what Lord Krishna is saying is, when a person dwells with the mind on sense objects, so the mind that the senses are focused on the sense objects, this lover who gives me you know, joy, uh, this sofa that gives me the comfort. I must have this, I must drive this car that makes me look good. So when a person dwells with the mind on sense objects, the person experiences attachment to them, kamaha. It, it's not ordinary, yeah, that's interesting, that's a good car, it'd be nice if I had it, it's okay if I don't have it. It's like an attachment, I must have it. From attachment springs this, uh, excessive desire known as ragaha and when this ragaha it's not an ordinary desire even I don't mind desiring for a bigger car than I have today no problem a more comfortable car with heated seats why not but if it becomes ragaha then I must have it why don't I have it by now why does my neighbor have it now I don't like them see this is ragaha, where it starts kind of clouding you. And when this desire is thwarted, it leads to krodaha, anger. This is what Krishna here, given this eight-step fall, the ladder of fall, from being happy to not being at all happy, you become angry. Then anger clouds your judgment. It leads to moha. It gives rise to delusion, known as moha. And then when you have moha, you can't think straight. Now you don't like your neighbor. Every time they smile at you, you frown. You don't know why. <laughs> it's not their fault that they have more money and they're driving a bigger car that you could have. But by now you're angry with them. You have a delusion. Now you're angry with people who look like your neighbor. This is all delusion, false, wrong conclusions. And when there is delusion, moha, it leads to loss of memory. Smriti vibhramsha. What does it mean? You forget all the learning that you had from past experiences, past teachers, past books. Now you only believe in your conclusions. And they're very tiny, collapsed, angry, grieving, delusional conclusions, but that's your only truth. And then when you lose your memory, there is nobody who can help you because all you, your own teachings, your own learning, your own experiences cannot come to your rescue. And ultimately, it leads to complete um, uh, viveka loss. It is a, you cannot judge between right and wrong. This path or that path, dharma or adharma, ethical or unethical behavior, you become your worst enemy and it leads to pranashyati, it leads to untold suffering. Nobody can help you. But what are we doing when we are following our bliss outwards? We are going down this chain. But whenever I told, whenever we study the Bhagavad Gita carefully, we realize that everything our senses lay their eye upon is not the ultimate gospel. Everything our mind wants may be something we want or we don't want. But this was not taught, this is not taught when we are just taught little pithy statements, which then create a whole, you know, a whole quest, a whole spiritual journey around it. So a delusion filled mind, an anger filled mind, a desire filled mind, an attachment filled mind, if you have those, this is the very opposite of bliss. 
Don't you agree? This, this is such deep, astute insight into the human behavior. So the purpose of the spiritual activity is to allow us to enjoy our sensory pleasures, but not become their slaves. To not lose our inner peace and our state of mind. And to gradually move more inwards so that in the end, our need, our desires ultimately are less because the person who has less lists of to-dos and must-haves, I don't know if you've had, some of you've had your list drop. Have you noticed that you actually feel an inner sense of bliss and okayness? Yes or no? Yes. And you still have what you need, but it's almost like nothing now can carry the power over you. I've had students who've told me that earlier when they would walk through Macy's on Black Friday, because I'm teaching this right after Thanksgiving, you know, everything would bother them because they had only so much money and there were such good sales and they wanted to buy everything. And they would come out of a department store feeling frustrated, less, having not achieved enough because they don't have a red sweater or they don't have a special pen with crystals in it, or they don't have a special upholster chair in their back of their car. And all that stuff made them feel less. But now these people told me that they can walk through a department store, enjoy everything, and walk out. Because the upholster chair and that pen with crystals and that red sweater that little ananda that they needed to get from that, they can get from within. So, of course, it didn't happen right away after one lecture, through meditation, through contemplation on this truth. So that is the goal. So this is just an example. I have nothing against Mr. Joseph Campbell, and I'm sure he has done great writing and you know teaching. But I think it more points to how we make our heroes and how we let our spiritual journey be guided by these teachings. Because after all, you know, our empirical experience is that our bliss lies in things and people outside. It's our empirical experience. But that is what anybody will tell you. A spiritual tradition will tell you it lies within you and here is how to find it. You know, that is what a spiritual tradition like the Upanishads was really teaching versus what was put out to the American public. So when a senses are controlled, they listen to you, your mind is calm and tranquil, that you overcome, you, you indulge a few desires, you, you, you are not ruled by the other desires, you will attain inner peace, inner stability, and in that quietness, who knows, bliss may emerge along with poetry, with creativity, with inspiration with a good night's sleep. All of these are examples of bliss. So <clears throat> um, this is the goal of Hinduism and the Vedas and the Vedic teachers, the Vedic scriptures like the Upanishads because they were, they were wanting us to not go for instant gratification that we've done over many lifetimes. What they wanted us to look was for the source of this gratification which is within you. This is how you overcome your suffering and make friends with your inner bliss. So there is a concept with bliss, which is called freedom. Are your senses free from their attachment to the world, to its things and people? When I look at my own dog, for example, I have a beautiful labradoodle right now. He was Originally, he belonged to my nephew, and now I'm raising him. And he's a beautiful soul. And I think he's a source of great joy for me, great pleasure for me. But when I look at him, I'm always cognizant of the fact that there is transience with his body, with my body, with my life as it is. So can I enjoy this beautiful, pleasurable, worldly gift aware can i keep my freedom because otherwise when i lose this or the fear of losing this will take away my joy so 
the concept of freedom of our senses, freedom of our mind, freedom of our thought process, and then the freedom to go within and encounter something deeper. This freedom is a real journey to bliss and not following your bliss. Now, one can argue that following your bliss was really following your bliss inward. So again, this is not about Joseph Campbell at all. This is just about how we take statements out of context, how writers place statements out of context from the Upanishad. Let me just borrow a little piece, throw it into my writing, and then how we follow that. This is a good teaching for us to see when we are studying in Zen Buddhism, Tantra, Yoga, Ayurveda, Vedanta, how deep has the teacher gone? How deep has their learning been? You know, and 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 are they conveying me the the whole piece or a big part of that piece or just packaged shiny particles of that tradition? So what did the Vedas do? So we're just talking about this one case and then I'll talk more. The Vedas, for example, they talked about four paths, Bhakti Yoga, Gnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Raj Yoga. In Bhakti Yoga, uh, you surrender to God, all your actions and all the benefits of your actions, and you achieve some bliss. In Gnana Yoga, you go inputs beyond the world of senses and mind, then you find your bliss. In Karma Yoga, you do good things for others. You act selflessly. And then you realize your mind has become very quiet and it's full of bliss. Genuine selflessness. I'm not talking about being a doormat and I'm not talking about being codependent. I'm talking about valuable service to humanity, to animals, to other creatures, to our planet. In Raj Yoga, we meditate and calm our mind and we reduce our thoughts. Then we find bliss. So do you see? There are entire teachings. And in fact, in the proper traditional Vedic path, even these four are united. You work with Karma Yoga, Raj Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and you prepare yourself for Gnana Yoga. So they are not silos, but this is a united journey. In, our, in duality based teachings of Vedanta, happiness comes from good thoughts, in, uh, from good even temper. In, uh, in, uh, in, spec in, uh, in qualified duality, where you are told that you are an aspect of the higher power, you are told that you can achieve through divine grace and through pure non-duality Vedanta, Advaita, your bliss is awaiting you when you have moksha or union with your true self. So there are all these teachings. So therefore, my, I rest my case to say to you, that when you hear another spiritual hat, be yourself. It doesn't mean your ordinary little self that is choking on beef jerky and, you know, um, stale food from last night, burping away and thinking, why can't I get up and walk? And at 8 p.m. you're still in your pajamas in your bed. Don't be yourself. <laughs> there is a small self and a, and a, and a, and a higher self or a wise self or a shining self or a light self that has to be discovered. Otherwise, we are just creating a self-centered spirituality and be yourself. So I sit around and, you know, and I don't do what I should be doing. This is a kind of um, uh, um, wrong teaching. Another one is you're already enlightened. Another one is, there is no such thing as enlightenment. That's not true. I myself have gone through a period of my life where mind felt cloudy. I talk openly about it, where, where, I, where I had doubts, where I, where I thought I was taking right decisions, but they were not the best decisions for me, my family, my community, the world, the planet, the universe. Today, I feel I have light inside me. That light makes me a restrained person, a responsible person, a genuine person, a dependable person. If I make mistakes, I openly accept them. I do have more light today. So don't believe in these, be yourself, you're enlightened right now. 
Here, take this mantra, repeat it all day, it shall enlighten you. These things are nothing but very shortcut teachings where they don't allow you to discern. The Vedic teacher helps you discern between what is your true self. Yes, you don't need to buy it from outside. It will get revealed within you, but it's like covered with clouds, just like the sun is always there, but some days you can't see it because the clouds are covering it, but the sun is still there. So the spiritual journey is like removing the clouds and letting your own light shine through. So yes, you are already enlightened in one sense, as in you don't need to buy the sun. The sun lives within you. But then to, to kind of just dismiss any work on your ego, any cleaning up, that will not work. Similarly, think positive. Think positive has a meaning and a purpose, especially when you tend to constantly look at the glass half fulls, but it cannot be the answer for everything. More than think positively, my teaching would be think realistically, think accurately. <laughs> Because if you overly think positive, then you will not be able to plan accordingly. You will just positively visualize an outcome, but you will not do what is needed, what steps you have to take. Meet a lawyer, check with an engineer, double check your, uh, your, uh, your accounts if you have the money to do what you want to do. If you just imagine success, if you just positively visualize the outcome, you may not be ready to face some of the obstacles and challenges that come your way. You are not ready to take into account, like, am I, what am I thinking? Is it accurate? How is it affecting my emotions? Am I being authentic here? What is my behavior? What would happen if things didn't work out? None of these thought processes come because I'm thinking positively. I'll just get up and visualize that I have awakened without necessarily, you know, meditating or eating right or thinking in a separate way or apologizing where I need to or asking someone else to take responsibility where they need to. We don't do that. Accurate thinking is the way to go and any deeper spiritual tradition, including the Buddha, has asked us not to have imaginary positive thinking but to have realistic thinking. Positive fantasies will slow you down and distract you and at the root of this positive thinking, which has also led to the whole at attract what you want, manifest what you want, is another big confusion. And that's my last teaching in this section. The confusion is that I will use, instead of saying I'm a work in progress and that's okay, and that not everybody gets everything because there is a law of karma and there are unequal endowments, we are saying that by becoming manifestors and attractions, one, we are following our bliss, and number two, we think, we human things, our ego things, we will use our willpower, which up till now couldn't even take us for our morning walk, by the way, okay? Uh, we're gonna use our willpower to alter the universe, okay? Now human ego has come to this level. We're just gonna alter the universe. And this notion that we will transform our material circumstance through sheer personal willpower is <laughs> applaud worthy, but sadly, not real. I want to tell you that for this alone, Lord Krishna has taught Karma Yoga. And he said in his famous teachings of Karma Nevadi Karasthi, he said, do not focus upon the outcome of your actions, they are not up to you. The outcomes of your actions are up to a greater will, a greater intelligence, an orchestration of so many factors. They are not just your mind and your little needs alone. The needs of the whole universe has to be considered when something comes your way or takes it away from you. One of my students came into a lot of money some years ago and I said, it is the universe's will, accept it. Universe wants to work through you for some things. One of my students lost money. It is the universe's will. There is a giant mathematics going on. There is a higher power. But when we did away with our gods, threw away our religions, and built, started following our bliss, we also created theories where we are now using our willpower 
to change our material circumstance. And, you know, I rest my case because these theories have been out and about for more than a decade. I don't think any significant change has happened to humanity's lot. They are attracting and manifesting away. They are just going down the ladder of desire, delusion, anger, grief, and sorrow. Over my many years as a spiritual teacher, I don't know how many hearts I have healed who felt they were personal failures because they could not attract or manifest. When they come to me and I teach them karma yoga, for example, I say, work hard and every night fall asleep like a baby. It is your sincerity that will move Lakshmi or Ganesha or Jesus towards you or, or that nameless, formless God, because ultimately in the Vedas, God is a nameless, formless, omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient, dimension, consciousness, energy, awareness. It is your sincerity. So many people pray to Lakshmi. So many people, you know, pray to the cheesy image of Lakshmi throwing dollars and coins through our hands. But Lakshmi will come out of turn and support you when you sincerely help an earthworm. When, you, when Lakshmi sees that you are being the divine mother in your own way, to tiny little insects, to stray dogs, to the poor in your community, you shall find so many doors open for you. So we think, so we are told, don't stress out on the outcome. If I was sitting here stressed out on the outcome, how many people are listening to me? Are they liking me? Are they making good comments? Should I do this? Should I do that? Maybe I'm attracting away a successful event. No, I'm bringing you my authenticity, my vulnerability, my genuineness, my presence, my inner connection with God, my own journey with truth. I'm here. What will happen due to this teaching may happen 100 years from now. That is up to someone else. Now, do you see? I'm relaxed. Now my bliss doesn't go away. I am like a child. I will play. I will build my sand castle. If the ocean wants, it will take it away. If the ocean wants, it will build a new castle for me. How did my sand castle get so big? Mother Ocean came and she dumped a lot of soil on it. I am happy to be part of a greater consciousness until I recognize that consciousness. So you see the deeper teachings don't get us caught up in little things. And if you think about it, all the teachers who are teaching the law of attraction manifestation, they are not attracting their success. They are working hard for their success. They are writing books. They are going on a teaching circuit. They are, they are having happening Instagram accounts and social media. They are working hard to, to be where they are, but they are teaching you to be daydreamers. And if you want to use your willpower, then use your willpower to be truthful, to be sincere, to be compassionate, and to, to, to move away the inner clouds and discover your inner sun. I know that I can talk hours and hours on this, but I'm going to stop. Because we are, in a way, continuing this discussion. But in the next part, when I come back after the Q&A, we're going to do a small Q&A. After that, I'll come back and I'll lead you through the nine-point realistic unhacking <laughs> process that you can take your own self through it. This cannot be, this is not, this is not a process that somebody, you know, manages for you. These are teachings that you can take home and become a much more alert and smart spiritual um, seeker of truth. And I've given you a few examples. Whenever you are coming across any spiritual tradition that is asking you to focus on one mantra, few yoga postures, one meditation twice a day. Be careful. Even Lord Buddha didn't give to the world the Buddhist meditation to be done 20, 20 minutes twice a day. This is not what Buddha taught. This is not how a great prince became God. This is not how a confused prince became a God. He was confused. His name was Gautama. He was confused. 
but he became an enlightened one. He gave knowledge. He gave wisdom. People lived with him for years to learn it. Can you be with one text of the Buddha and go deep? Can you be with a teacher of Upanishads and Veda and go deep? Don't reduce your greatest quest. If you have to be a mason or a carpenter or a, or a sketch artist, you have to go for years to school. Why are you reducing your spiritual journey to uh, one Ted, Ted, uh, one Ted, Ted, what is it? Ted talk Ted. here, one podcast there, uh, one retreat here. You can do all that, but they can take your mind away. Your senses get more and more clouded. Settle down, go deep and come out changed. Your inner confused prince or princess the ego has to has to become enlightened. That is the root word of Buddha comes from you know, buddhi, the enlightened noetic mind, the true north of your mind, of your thinking that you can reach and don't let people tell you that there is no such thing as spiritual journey, there is no value in old traditions because these ancient traditions like the Vedas, Buddhism, Zen, they have deep, deep roots. They have checks and balances that can prevent you from getting lost in the shadows and truly make progress day after day, month after month, year after year. Mm -hmm.